I have been asked to speak on diabetic macular edema and I rather choose this subject basically for postgraduates basically because this is one of the most heartening things in the field of retina. Diabetic macular edema, our understanding of this disease process, there is a paradigm shift in the understanding of this disease basically because of the availability of newer diagnostic techniques in the form of retinal thickness and analyzers, optical coins, tomography. And there is the newer modalities of treatment which are now available to us. It started with once upon a time it was just lasers, lasers, lasers. And now we have it started with steroids and now even every other day you hear a new molecule being introduced and there is such a raw confusion in everyone's mind where and when should we treat this disease and which molecule. So during this journey in the following few slides, I would like to make it a bit simpler for you to understand and how to treat your patient once he walks into your opinion. As we are all aware that diabetes mellitus has assumed a big epidemic proportions, probably because of an increased aging population due to increased life expectancy even in our country and more importantly lifestyle changes associated from because of rural to urban migration. If you trust WHO, according to WHO, as on day, there are more than 230 million diabetics on the face of this earth. And by 2030, we would be no less than 370 million. I don't understand much of the uh, jargon of this statistics mentioned over here, but the, the basic thing is, if we ever land up with such a big epidemic where we would be more than 270 million diabetics by 2030, the question which the statisticians or the health planners are really worried about is are we geared up as a doctors, as a human health providers to provide health care even if it is available in such a large portion. India is nowhere behind. In fact, this is the field where India is leading and by 2025 we will be the diabetic capital of the world. The cure study which was conducted in India, very few studies have been conducted regarding the prevalence of this disease. Cures was conducted by Shankar Nehtral in Chennai and which showed the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy as high as 18% as on the date of diagnosis. So coming to diabetic macular edema my topic. The word for terminology for this particular thing was diabetic maculopathy, but as on day, we all of the veterinary surgeons coined the term diabetic macular edema. And to, for your convenience, it is any retinal thickening or the edema or hard exudates within one disc diameter of the foveal uh, vascular zone. I am not getting the point. Okay. Within this, it's close to the uh, foveal vascular zone, then it is called diabetic macular edema. The cause of concern is this diabetic macular edema attacks the person in a young age group, in a productive age group, and therefore naturally the socio-economic repercussions for the society is going to be very large, basically because it affects the productivity of a working age group. As is apparent over from these various slides that as the diabetic age increases, so does the increase, there is an increasing incidence of diabetic macular edema, so also the incidence of diabetic macular edema increases with the stages of diabetic retinopathy. That is, from a mild and period to period, the incidence increases almost up to 70%. So what are the factors which are responsible or implicated for development of diabetic retinopathy or macular edema? Diabetic age, hyperglycemia and associated systemic disease are the three most important factors which are responsible for development of diabetic macular edema. Besides the list of drug, uh, other uh, three factors which are mentioned over here. This is the single most important risk factor in the development of diabetic macular edema and that is diabetic age. So what does diabetic age mean? It is the duration that has lapsed from the date of diagnosis till day. Till day. So we were di diagnosed as a diabetic in 1997 and this is 2013 or 2014, you are at the diabetic age is 17 years. So more is the diabetic age, more is the chances of having any form of diabetic retinopathy. And unfortunately, this diabetic age is a non-modifiable risk factor. The second modifiable risk factor is presence of increased blood sugar, that is hyperglycemia. 
modifiable means this is the factor where you can work on to prevent the secondary complications of diabetic retinopathy anywhere inside the body. Many studies have clearly shown that if, if there is a rigid control of sugars, even if even if you control the diabetic micro, uh, diabetic uh, hyperglycemia very rigidly and maintain it at a new glycemic uh, level, still the diabetic retinopathy or macular edema is bound to come. Then what is the use? It is basically because if you control it rigidly, the chances of development of and progression of retinopathy and the severity of retinopathy is going to be late and less. Anything which causes a hormonal imbalance in the body, be it a pubertal, grow, a pubertal spurt or a growth hormonal spurt or a pregnancy, wherever there is a change in the millennium of your uh, hormonal status, there will be a flare up of your uh, pre existing diabetic retinopathy. Similarly, associated systemic diseases like hypertension, nephropathy, anemia, and renal factors play a big role. We will come to its importance later on. <coughs> Now coming to classifying diabetic macular edema, the age old classification when we go across to our book is it is classified as focal, diffuse and ischemic. The focal means a small part of it is involved, diffuse means the total macula is involved in ischemic where there is a loss of vascular vascularity or there is a ischemia in that region. This classification was basically based on Clinical observation with the help of a slit lamp by microscopy using a 78 or 90 D lens where the thickness was assumed on a clinical basis and it was subjected to. Then came the AO classification where it included the severity of the disease where it was classified as DME apparently absent and DME apparently present. And if DME was present, then it was classified as mild, moderate, severe. Mild means few. The definition over here is given for your convenience. <coughs> then when the ETDRS study came, they wanted something like it. They created a further uh, classification of diabetic macular edema as DME, uh, CSME and non-CSME. This is a third classification and this has an implication from the form of treatment. So, if there is a CSME, that is an exudate or edema which is within 500 microns of the center or any edema or exudate which is more than 1500 microns but about a diameter away from the FAZ, it needed treatment. So, this classification was based on which treatment, which macular edema, diabetic maculopathy needs treatment or not. But in spite of having these three classification, there was always a confusion. For example, here you see in this asteroid, there are few focal exudates. What on the hand you, you should be a diffuse diabetic macular edema. So there was always a debate whether we should be call it a focal or a diffuse. Then in the OCD, we started challenging the classification which was based on clinical as well as only angiography. For example, if you see this is a treated case of maculopathy, there is some exudate and edema over here. You would call it the focal maculopathy. But an angiogram, you see such a big involvement, you would call it a diffuse diabetic macular edema. And now when you do an OCT, you see a little macular traction. So how should we classify? And therefore, the need for liver classification started coming and then came the classification which is based on Optical coherence tomography, which gives you the sectional view of a macula, like spongy, type 2 CSME, subphobia, serous detachment, and this. And if you go by the previous classification, we would treat all the cases with laser. And in fact, laser in these three cases, subtypes based on an OCD, is more harmful to the patient. Now coming to once you have a clinical, you have seen a diabetic macular edema, you will come to the investigations. How do you investigate? The basic four investigations are mentioned here. The fundus photography, it has been a few studies have very clearly shown that there is 23% more chance of taking a lesion on a fundus photograph compared to a indirect ophthalmoscopy or a clinical fundus evaluation. And for that you need to do Seven EPDRS patterns of overlapping patterns of uh, fundus photograph. And now, with the availability of, of TOS, where you have almost 200 degree view of uh, uh, retina, yes, definitely it is a costly option, but it is going to be the future where you can see your uh, macular edema and a stomach drop of the areas here. 
Then comes the age old fundus florus in angiography. Fundus florus in angiography has a role even in today's context with the, in, in spite of the presence of OCP. It not only helps you in picking up the microaneurysms where you can actually laser it, but in a hazy media where there is asteroid, you can still pick up a, 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 a leading aneurysms there. And it also helps you in differentiating from the other simulating lesions. Now, here is a classic example. You see few microaneurysms or a few dot images and you feel why is this patient deteriorating. You do an angiogram and you see such a gross. And this is the real help of, it, of um, what we call fundus florus in angiography. Similarly, a well adequately treated case of a diabetic retinopathy, macropathy, having a progressive visual loss. An angiograph shows a ischemic macula, so you have an answer. So this is how the role of angiogram still play, uh, has an importance. Even there are dense asteroid, you could not visualize so well the retina, but on an angiogram you see over here, you can see the leaking microneurysms and you can treat it. So you do not need to, uh, in spite of the hazy media, because of an asteroid you could pick up because of an angiogram. Or similar looking lesions, simulating lesions like paraphosis, ectasia, or CMDM can be differentiated. Then comes the second time of investigation that is optical coronary tomography. This has come in a big way in the management of diabetic macular edema. It has basically come in a big way because it is non-invasive in nature. Second thing is the edema can be quantified actually in microns and so the response to the treatment can be well monitored. Only limitation is that if the media opacity and your vision is less than 6 by 60 or something, you might not get a very good supportive uh, uh, I mean, sir, picture with it. Then these are the newer tools which have a limited role. I would run through it for want of time. But to summarize the list of investigation in diabetic macular edema, even in today's context, both fundus florus and angiography and OCT are complementary and compulsory investigation in understanding a diabetic macular edema. Now coming to the management of macular edema, that is diabetes. Any time prevention is better than cure, and therefore first we will talk about how can we prevent development of diabetic retinopathy, and that is the single most modifiable risk factor is hyperglycemia. So control of hyperglycemia and associated systemic disease is equally important. The liver literature and with a better understanding, we know that glitazons exacerbate. Glitazons are an anti-diabetic drugs which we use for bringing down the sugars. But glitazons are known to exacerbate the diabetic macular edema. And so the patients who are on glitazons need to be shifted to some other with the help of your intern uh, physician. Besides hyperglycemia control, now our understanding tells it will not only when your patient comes with a sugar uh, report that his sugars are under control, but you do not investigate him and start treating him, you are doing injustice to this. Equally important is the systemic control of associated factors like anemia, renal parameters, lipid dyslipidemia and hypertension. The last study has very clearly shown that this renin angiotensin system inhibitors which are anti-hypertensive medicines. Definitely we understand if we use anti-hypertensive, if your blood pressure is under control with an adequate diabetic control, your diabetic retinopathy is less likely to progress. But this RAS study has highlighted further beyond that, that even in a normotensive patient, if we use RAS inhibitors, it slows the progression of retinopathy by 65 to 70 percent independent of its effect on BP. And this is a very important observation. Similarly, a Euclid study which also shows same thing. Lisonectrate reduces the progression of diabetic retinopathy by 50% and progression of PDR by 80%. So, these are the newer things probably coming time you will see it not only as used as an anti-hypertensive agent, but probably we are looking at using it as to prevent diabetic macular edema or progression of diabetic retinopathy. Then, Dyslipidemia increases, exacerbates diabetic macular edema is established part. But this field study which was used, which shows that there is a significant reduction in progression of retinopathy if you control dyslipidemia, acceptable. But beyond that, phenofibrates also affects the, <coughs> or has an independent effect on lipid, uh, on the diabetic macular edema. 
So again, I think Australian uh, health study has given the permission to use now uh, about this phenobarbital uh, uh, as a anti-diabetic macular edema medicine has been given the permission to start that study. So this should be the ideal goal for a diabetic patient which was prescribed by ESAP. Then there are other medical treatments which were talked about like using aspirins and blood anticoagulant drugs. A patient of a diabetic macular edema also has associated heart diseases and he needs for his survival aspirin and antiplatelet agents. Should we stop? The Damag study has very clearly established that there is no role of aspirin. Means once upon a time it was believed it was sluggish blood flow leads to development of diabetic retinopathy. But that concept was negated by Damag study. Same thing is, does aspirin increase the chances of bleed inside the diabetic macular or diabetic retinopathy? Again, Damag study has very clearly said that there is no contraindication even in a case of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Which means, if the patient needs aspirin and any other antiplatelet agents for his systemic reasons, it should well be continued even in the uh, for, even in the case of a PDR. Similarly, there is no rule of aldose reductors uh, inhibitor according to sardine and retinopathy trial. Now coming to hypoglycemic agent, I did mention that glitazones cause and exercise by diabetic macular edema and so if your diabetic patient is on that, you need to shift into other anti-diabetic agents. Laser is the gold and the old standard, the old treatment which has been gold standard as on day two I have mentioned because tomorrow what it will be I can't say. And how do you do a laser? If there is a bleeding aneurysm, you leave uh, uh, photocoagulate it. And if there are areas where there are thickening, you also laser that, that is great laser. So usually as on day, you treat microaneurysms as well as the areas of retina thickening that is called modified grade treatment. And these are some of the classical examples, pre-treatment, post-treatment. The heart exudates would go over a period of time. When do you associate and do pan retina photocoagulation along with diabetic macular edema? If you have ischemic areas of macula and ischemic areas in peripheral retina, you have to add pan retinal photocoagulation to this. <coughs> Similarly, cataract surgery worsens diabetic maculopathy and therefore it should be treated or addressed before the removal of cataract, either if media permits with laser or with an anti major agent. Laser, yes, acceptable is a gold standard, but it is far from ideal. Why? Basically because it causes tissue damage. Tissue damage means the patient has to accept decreased night vision, decreased visual field and reduce contrast sensitivity. Besides, can, I, sir, can I request you not to take pictures of the slides without asking the author? Thank you. I'm sorry. Besides the complications like migration of exudates, or CNVM or serous detachment. Yes, poor success. Besides that, laser also has a very limited role in case of a diffuse diabetic macular edema. It does not respond so well as it does in a focal diabetic macular edema and it has at all no role in ischemic and vitreo macular traction agents of the anemia. And more importantly, ATIDRS only talked about preventing visual loss and never it spoke about increasing the vision and that is why laser soul in coming future is getting challenged and therefore we are on a lookout for a better treatment option. The first pharmacological agent which was tried and is still being tried is a corticosteroids. Corticosteroids Probably because of this various rational for steroids is anti-inflammatory, anti-apoptic, anti-inflammatous and anti-angiogenic in nature and pain pepper injections were tried once upon a time. The studies have very clearly indicated there is no beneficial effect of peripheral steroids in management of diabetic macular <coughs> Now, intravitreal transinolone. It has a promising role in selected few and the DRCR network has now clearly said that there is no ideal effect along with laser except in few cases of pseudophagic eyes. More importantly, in a steroid responder, almost one third of the patients are steroid responders which will end up needing their anti glaucoma medication and there would be progression of cataract and, and that is why the role of intravitreal diabetic uh, steroids has come into 
not having it has fallen its revenue. And these are some of the cases where you see beautiful resolution of a contour. This is diabetic macular edema pre-treatment, post-treatment. The other problem with the steroids was that it needed repeated injection. So once you inject six to eight weeks, the edema would be there, then the baby reforms effect. And it means it needed on and off every repeat of injection. And repeat injections means more chances of invasive procedure, complications of invasive procedure. And therefore the thought of extended release came. Various companies started with various drugs like Iveration, Regisert, Illumin, and finally the Spozodrex. The first three drugs, the trials had to be stopped basically because of the glaucoma and the uh, uh, associated complications with it. Only as one day, Ozodrex is the only drug which is used as an intravitreal implant where dexamethasone is given as a default preparation. And these are the various studies which show the role of MEAD and the plastic study shows the promising role of this agent in cases of diabetic macular edema and the Champagne study. The, but with a better understanding and the better availability of molecules like antivirgins, <coughs> the role again is getting challenged of a steroid inside the eye basically because of cataractogenic and glaucomogenic nature of any steroid. <coughs> Then came the other pharmacological agent that is anti vector the three molecules listed over here. And this is how you can get a beautiful resolution treatment and, uh, and the post treatment over here with various agents. Hmm? Various studies are now centered around the use of anti vector in the uh, management of diabetic macular edema. The DRCR network is a multi-centered randomized control trial which is happening in US at various centers and various very useful clinical information as we have acquired through this. And which has very clearly shows that anti vegel or IV dynamizumab is more effective than laser alone. <coughs> the result study, the read and the rise, rise and the right study has very clearly shown that there is an improved vision means with the anti major use we started talking about improvement in the vision and also supplementary lasers were tried along with an anti major patient to decrease the need of monthly anti major injections and various studies were conducted and are on sale where the results are ex anticipated and means the part uh, results are available where according to the RCR network study, they feel that you should inject three injections at a uh, six injections at a monthly interval and then watch it and as soon as basis is you keep on treating the uh, edema. Because of the cost prohibitive nature, the verasizumab, which is a cheaper molecule, uh, is being tried and the whole study also shows equally effective as as effective as a uh, docent is the role of uh, Avastin. anti major agents definitely have some advantages over laser that it causes no tissue destruction and also it talks about increased vision. But the limitation is it is invasive in nature. Every month you have to get injected inside your eye. And in any procedure, invasive means increased risk of adoptomatitis, detachment and trace hemorrhage. More importantly, the moment you withdraw this medicine, there is a chance of recurrence. Third, most importantly, we talk about repeat injections for infinite period of time. Unlike AMD where the patients are old age group, these are younger patients. So for at 40 you start receiving injections, how long? For how many years? That is the only concept. Besides anti if the other molecule like major trap which is now being lost in the uh, US also speaks about a good efficacy where it might be given about 6 to 8 weekly probably. The Darwin C F uh, study has clearly shown the uh, role of anti uh, so vegetative trap in diabetic macular edema. These are the other agents which are being tried, like ocular serolimus, advanced glycation in products, somatostatins, other redox inhibitors, which I have run through, and uh, where you can get any of this. But all these are experimental, and people are studying this for its use and the problem with this. So, how do you manage diabetic macular edema? There is no central involvement. You treat according to TDRS guidelines, means do a laser. But if there is a central involvement with no visual loss, observe and treat according to TDRS guidelines, that is lasers. If there is a visual loss due to DME with a central involvement, use an anti -vegetal. Then the last treatment which is available nowadays is minimally invasive surgery for diabetic macular edema. 
and the DRCR network study has clearly shown that following a vitrectomy, there is a good technique, uh, retinal thickening decreases in most of the eyes and visual acuity gain is seen in 38%, a uh, 38% hacking network improvement. While complications with minimally invasive surgery is almost less. So how does vitreous surgery help a diabetic macular edema? Vitreotomy decreases the concentration of DME promoting factor in the vitreous cavity. It improves fluid current and oxygenation of inner retina, improves peripheral retina microcirculation and release of trash. An additional step which can be done along with this is an internal limiting membrane peeling. Few of the surgeons like me are very fond of this particular step. It helps you in removing residual vitreous fraction. It prevents re-proliferation of epiretinal membrane. Almost 10% of the post vitrectomy eye tend to develop epiretinal membrane. So you can avoid by removing an uh, eye lamp. And it helps you in better oxygenation of the viable tissues. And this uh, vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema comes very close to ideal treatment of DME in the form of C. What are the parameters on which we grade the treatment is good or not? Like efficacy, safety, durability, low cost, need of infrequent examination and availability. <coughs> and if you see MIVS, resolution of the edema is seen by 50% within a mile. And more importantly, this edema, once it comes down, it usually does not recur back, unlike anti-major patient, but after a month, again it recurs back if you do not re-inject. The safety of MIBS over normal vitreous surgery is now uh, needs no mention and it has become a very safe surgery. More importantly, the economics of a, a minimally invasive vitreous surgery versus an anti major as mentioned over here, and indirect cost of anti major which are because of loss of productivity, every month he has to come to your clinic, miss two or three days because of getting injected, is what is making vitreous surgery as a primary choice of treatment for, for few surgeons thinking more. But what are the limitations of any vitreous surgery? MIBS definitely is a skill dependent surgery. Peeling out internal limiting membrane is not that uh, easy for everyone and therefore it is a surgeon skill dependent unlike anti-temperature which can be injected even by a resident. Besides that, few of the studies have shown, uh, most of the studies have shown that it does not lead to improved vision. But why? Basically because if you go through the studies, most of the studies have done surgery as a last ditch effort as a, when other modalities of treatment have failed. So these are some of the uh, cases where pre-op and post-op when we have operated about a month later this patient uh, showing get good resolution of diabetic macular edema. Even in such hard exudates, about four months later you can see the resolution of edema and this exudates might take months. You can see the normal restoration of contour over here. This is a short video which shows after completion of a vitrectomy why you stay in the internal limiting membrane with a brilliant blue dye and that's why you get a bluish hue over there and with the island peeling forceps you are peeling the internal limiting membrane which is supposed to be the innermost layer of retina. And that is the modality one form of treatment of diabetic macular edema as a day. Once upon a time, vitreous surgery was only meant for vitreous hemorrhage, fractional retinal detachment. While we are talking about doing a vitreous surgery for macular edema without any of these complications. So, to summarize, today's diabetic macular edema means not only control of blood sugar, that is fasting post meal or glycosylated hemoglobin, you should insist upon your patient to get his other parameters like renal lipid and anemic factors under control. As on date, angio and OCD still are complementary and compulsory investigation in the management or understanding of a diabetic macular edema. As on date, laser still is a primary modality of treatment for focal and diffuse maculopathy. But lasers are never done in cases of ischemic macula and in the presence of vitreomacular traction. Steroids, anti are coming in a big way. Steroids, more than steroids, anti has come in a big way and in fact, over a period of time, it might be a year down the line, I might talk about uh, laser uh, was a past and might be anti-vegetative is, is the truth. 
they I might play a say so after a year because not many studies are happening. But as of date, anti-VEGF has a role in a diffuse diabetic macular edema with a central involvement. And uh, uh, where the patient should be ready to get injected almost throughout his life with a monthly injection. Vitreous surgery, especially minimally invasive vitreous surgery has come in a big way in resistant cases of diabetic macular edema and sometimes as a primary modality of treatment in DNA. Thank you.